just don't know what, what really causes this phenomenon. So this has been going on for a very long time, but every time it happens, the scientists come up with a new requirement. Welcome to Don't Turn Around, a podcast about the extraordinary and the unexplained and the profound impact these events can have on our lives. This is a space for amazing stories and explorations of the human experience. And if you've got a story and you'd like to share it, don't hesitate to shoot me a note at dtapodcastinfo at gmail.com. Got to talk about the Patreon pledges. Don't turn around. Would not even be here if it wasn't for that amazing community over there on Patreon. And if you want to help support the show for less than a cup of coffee a month, chipping into the hat, you can uh, help make these episodes possible. Don't forget to check out Old Spirits, the YouTube series produced by T. Morris and I. We just released a recent episode called the Northern Virginia Roundup. And in the coming weeks, we'll be uh, doing an evidence reveal with Wynn Brewer at Linville Manor. But hey, let's get into that interview. Tonight's guest is a repeat offender. I am delighted to have her back on the show. She's a traveler. She is an author. She's an explorer of the uncanny and weird and unexplained. She is pretty effing spooky. Amanda Paulson, welcome back to Don't Turn Around. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be back. I am. It was 2021 was the last time we talked. Uh, oh my god! Uh, December of 2021, I believe, and I can't believe it's 2023. And no uh, what the heck happened? Time. <laughs> we'll probably end up talking about the nature of time mm-hmm. before we're done talking tonight. <laughs> but I want to know what have you been up to? You have been very busy. You've been out and about. Even went overseas, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yep. Since I've last talked to you, yes. So break it break it down for me. Sure. So, oh man, uh, last summer I went overseas uh, with Strange Escapes. Um, yeah. I just attended one of their events. Um, cool. Super cool, super fun, super awesome people, um, and got to explore the Paris catacombs, Stonehenge, <laughs> um, some places in Spain. Um, yeah, it was an awesome time. That's incredible. Um, Super cool, super cool opportunity for me to just uh, hang out with other weird folks and um, and not really investigate too much. I didn't do too much investigating, but just traveled and saw things that I'd never seen before, um, which was awesome. And then since then, I've been working on, um, you know, attending some screenings, some premieres of my documentary Death is With Me. So exciting. So exciting. Uh, we had a screening in Seattle and one in Spokane, which is where I live. And um, and then just recently, I got back from a trip to Gettysburg and Washington, D.C. Oh, you were right in my backyard. I really? Wish I had known. I would have, uh, we're about an hour and 10 minutes south of Gettysburg. So I didn't realize. Kind of so, <laughs> <laughs> so where I'm at, like, I feel like the drive to people or like things are farther away. And I didn't realize how many people I knew that were within like an hour driving (laughs) to Gettysburg. (laughs) Luckily I had a friend uh, and their partner who um, came out like on a split second notice to come uh, see us. And they were like, Oh my God, you're so close. But I, I didn't realize how close I was to, or else I would have, I don't know, tried to meet up with as many people as possible, but the That's East Coast always is a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> always a challenge. The East Coast is a foreign land to me still. I've only been over there twice now, which is wild to say. I've okay. been everywhere, but nowhere. There's still so many places I need to visit, <laughs> but. Yeah, it was really cool. That's but yeah, so, that's that's basically what I've been up to. So what? I, there's so much to talk about just right there. Um, we'll start with the last and work our way back. Tell me about Gettysburg. Where'd you go? What did you see? What did you do? Oh, Gettysburg was awesome. I is this your first time? Was it was my first time. time. Okay, mm-hmm. my first time. Oops, and um, and I didn't know how I was going to feel about. Gettysburg. I was feeling a little conflicted on diving into like civil war or war history in general yeah, yeah. in relation to the paranormal. I was like kind of weird about it. Um, but also it's just su- super new to me. I've never like mm-hmm. been somewhere like that ever. Um, yeah. And we stayed at the Farnsworth Inn the first uh, night in the Sarah Black room, yes, yes. which I am 
I'm funny. So I went with four other of my friends, all investigators, and they knew exactly where we were going. I apparently hadn't done any (laughs) research at all because we're literally on our way. Or I think it was like the day before we met up and I was like, are we even staying anywhere haunted? Are we like, where are we staying at? It's just a hotel, right? And they were like, we're literally staying in one of the most haunted places in Gettysburg. And I'm like, oh, neat. That's nice. But um, the Farnsworth Inn was very active. Um, My friend Sharice and I shared a room, the Sarah Black room, um, which I don't know if anyone listening has seen anything about the Farnsworth or been there themselves. Um, But... Uh, Sarah Blackroom's right underneath the attic and I heard somebody walking around in the attic all night. I woke up in the middle of the night, um, sick to my stomach. I was fine, but just kind of randomly sick to my stomach in the middle of the night. I wake up, I'm like trying to go back to bed and I just hear somebody walking down the attic and then down the stairs and then it, and then it'd be back in the attic somehow. So not a back and forth, but kind of a like a restart. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Stop. It was really Re- interesting. Rewind, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, it, it was just a weird, weird night, but. And a little bit of Farnsworth house trivia uh, for those of my listeners that are familiar with Gettysburg. That is uh, said to be where the sniper that inadvertently shot Jenny Wade had been camped out in the attic at the Farnsworth house. And is apparently where, I could be mixing my facts a little bit, but is where he took the shot from that inadvertently took the one and only civilian casualty of the civil war. I do believe that is correct. That's what they're still saying. So yeah. that's the story we heard too. And I didn't know that before staying there. <laughs> so. <laughs> and now you're educated. That's, yes. that's great. So yeah. from, so you stayed at the Farnsworth house. Where else did you hit? Uh, we also stayed at a farm Um, It was on Airbnb. So we rented a couple of rooms inside of a house, like shared, you know, shared the house with the owners. But it was on this farm that was Confederate retreat land. And their barn had been turned into a makeshift hospital when the Confederate soldiers were retreating and kind of dumping bodies off is how it was told the story. And, um, and so we had all this land, the barn, the rooms to investigate, um, Apparently the farm had been on a couple shows before. I don't remember what shows that she said, but, um, but most of the activity she said happens in the barn or out on the land. And um, we had a really, really in- interesting investigation out in the barn. Um, Ghoul's trip podcast. Those girls okay. that was yeah. with them. Yes. They, yes. they have, awesome. they have the footage. They're the ones who were smart and took all the video. So we're <laughs> waiting for them to review it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we got to investigate the barn and, um, contacted, um, a man that was hanging out on the second floor of the barn, which we couldn't access because the floor was going to give out, they said, so we couldn't go up there, but that didn't seem to be a problem because that's how these things work. Apparently of course. <laughs> like, like normal human things don't matter to them. So, right. um, we had some really successful, um, experiments with, uh, doing like a double Estes method yeah. and using the tripwire and stuff. It was super cool. Um, and didn't see any ghost horses. They did tell us that we might see a ghost yeah. horse. Did yeah. not see that. I would bummer. love to see a ghost horse. Me too. I would really, really love that. I was really in the zone <laughs> out in that field in the middle of the night. I was like, where is it? I, if Where's I just look long enough, <laughs> yeah, it'll show up. But not this time, apparently. But it was still a really good trip. And that was it. Or in my first night, I stayed in D.C., um, mm-hmm. which I didn't do any ghost hunting there. But I did, right. I did do like a sprint around DC in the middle of the night to see white house, uh, Lincoln Memorial and Washington monument. I was like, I've got to see those things. And, hit them. and I hit them. I saw my phone died. I had to take the subway back to my Airbnb. I, I am an idiot, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird, and that's my start of the, of the trip and then ghost the rest. But overall loved Gettysburg. I loved DC. Um, I just, love it in that area in general it seems if anyone you uh live there um and don't appreciate it sometimes or get sick of it i'm telling you it's pretty nice over there i know your winters are hard but very clean very friendly people lots of ghosts i really appreciate lots of ghosts. it mm-hmm. lots of we are so close to so many incredible incredible places well if you love it so much then hopefully you'll come back out this way 
Oh, absolutely. And yes. Let I have me to. know because we will take you to some locations with us uh, and it will be a blast. So absolutely. I'm going to remind you about that. Yes. So and a question immediately jumped to me as you were talking about Gettysburg. East Coast ghosts versus West Coast ghosts. Is there, you know, a different flavor? Is the energy feel at all different? And, and I know it's, it's hard to probably suss out a little bit because I find that battlefields have a very particular kind of vibration to them, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah. You, it was a little different than what you commonly experience uh, out West. Yeah. It's interesting because in trying to like formulate an answer for that, I'm trying to remove some bias because yeah. I've got it in my head that East Coast ghosts are <laughs> white Victorian ladies or like, <laughs> Civil War soldiers, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then over here are like tree ghosts or something, or like fairies right, like and like Bigfoot. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but there that. is definitely, at least speaking from like the energy of the land, there's definitely mm-hmm. a different feeling. Um, and over here, despite where you are in the Pacific Northwest, I feel much closer. Like the spirit or the energy of the land is much more to the forefront or like, um, like there is a more primordial energy over here that kind of comes forward, even in investigations and investigations out here tend to go in a really kind of more almost alien esque or like Bigfoot esque fairy or whatever kind of high strangeness direction and investigations almost always go in that direction over here. Whereas on the East coast I found, um, and that's not, Obviously, there are exceptions. We have locations where you can yeah. contact ghosts, but that's just like the general vibe over here. But the uh, is the Bigfoot East, gatekeeping the ghosts. <laughs> it's only Bigfoot and aliens over here. No, <laughs> um, not Bigfoot. There, the ghosts there are it. some ghosts, but they're chilling yeah. with the aliens and good. Yeah. Ghosts. But anyway, um, but yeah, so much more like a primordial energy over here. Not that that's not on the East Coast, but it did seem like it was easier, or maybe perhaps there was more of the traditional um, kind of dead person, like ghost, yeah, you know, yeah. like person who has unfinished business ghost. And it felt yeah. like the the answers that we were getting during investigating it, like the responses felt um, more literal and more human than over yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's interesting. Interesting. But. Yeah. My, and that's been my impression getting out to the various sites out here. We also do our outdoor investigations where we trudge into the woods to find these abandoned spaces. And you find that there's pockets where it feels like that sort of nature, spiritual energy, that that older kind of energy is definitely present, is very prominent. Uh, but you don't generally find that across whole great swaths of area. It's really kind of localized, maybe into just specific spots in a specific location. So it's, it's there, but it's almost like it's, it's constricted a bit. And I just wonder if that's because, you know, the East coast is fairly dense population wise. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where the expansion across the country uh, began. But unless you're getting up into the, you know, the Appalachian mountains or otherwise, you know, civilization is not all that, all that far off. So mm-hmm. I wonder if that has has some impact. But then it does surprise you, too, sometimes where these more kind of older, ancient vibes pop up. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's really interesting. I've, I was wondering about that, and I'm glad I have someone that I can ask that has now experienced both. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it does, just to uh, one last thought on that, like I'm sure it does have something to do with like um, newer uh, – I want to say colonization, you know, like newer people living in the land, like since the expansion happened from starting from there to over here. Yeah. Um, and this would be like hundreds of years of difference, but I wonder if that has something to do with it. I wonder if the more densely populated and the more um, Westernized and like the more things pile on top of it, then like on the East coast, it's just the, those traditional, like almost newer spirits are just, closer? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. could talk about that forever, but yeah, oh, there's yeah, something to it. There's show. something to it for sure. That is cool. So death is with me. You've been doing screenings of this and I have to ask if you traveled back in time and paid a visit to 
seven, eight year old you who was starting to have some paranormal experiences and was maybe discounting them and said, Hey, when you grow up, you're, you're going to make a film, you're going to be at screenings and you're going to be fine. What would, uh, what would seven year old you have said back? <laughs> um, I'm going to have, this is such an annoying answer. I apologize ahead of time. I'm, <laughs> I'm so annoying. Um, but I've been, th- I've been reflecting on this a lot in the different stages of my life and, and, um, yeah understanding how and why I got to the place that I am now. But when I was seven or eight, I would have not been surprised. I I thought I was, (laughs) I thought I was so cool. And I, when I was very young, although I wasn't divulging my experiences and my family didn't really want to hear it because I was raised Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, At that time, I did very much believe that it was real. And I also wanted to be a pop star. So those two things (laughs) together mean made total sense to yeah <laughs> but then i grow up a little bit and i get into high school and my early 20s uh life you know kind of um dulls that down i start to doubt my paranormal experiences um in my late teens wondering if it was because of trauma or what have you yeah. um and right. kind of settle into regular uh regular life regular adult life at that point i would have not believed that i would be in the place that I am now. And I think it is, um, it speaks to like resilience and understanding that whatever is happening in your life right now is not forever. Cause I just turned 33 uh, a week ago. Um, and thank you. And, um, and I feel like I'm just now figuring things out. Like things are just now shaking out in a way that feels really good. And not just because of the screenings and the, the, tension from it like that kind of you know being on the big screen it's awesome but yeah also just being fully accepted for ev- everything that i am everything that i'm saying is, is very still very new to me um yeah so yeah the short of it is uh teen me would not believe it but little me ha- was on something right and knew that i could get here i listen to your inner child you know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, I got I got to go back to that, but I just want to. Another thought occurred to me. You're saying it's it's pretty gratifying to achieve some sort of acceptance community wise. Do you feel, in a way, you've been able through this journey to, you know, accept certain things about yourself, accept certain things about life and and past traumas and and. And someone very close to me who who I lost this past year, she was very fond of saying, Phil, she would say, my friend Phil is what she would always say. She said, you can accept something and and still not like it. You know, but it, by accepting it, you're acknowledging it and and you are able to, you know, move past it. And you're not gonna forget it, but it 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 finds its place on the shelf and just like an old dusty book where you might get something valuable out of a few passages, you know, there it is. Do you feel that's, that's been part of this journey for you? That's made it easier or not easier, but has helped you achieve some acceptance. Yeah. I mean, gosh, I have so many thoughts. My brain is swirling, but um, (laughs) yeah, there are some things that I've um, come like, come to terms with in the last few years. And this also not to like talk about age too much, like literal age, because numbers don't really matter. But when you turn 30 and I am assuming you're in your thirties. Thank you. I love you so much. Forties. Oh, (laughs) yes, I am. (laughs) Well, then you understand. I'm going to do the Will Ferrell like 50. (laughs) I would have guessed like 38. I don't know, but. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, we're going to go with that, 38. Thank you. Okay, yeah, well. The check, the check is in the mail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but when you, there is something to be said about when you reach 30 or going into your 30s that you just start kind of understanding yourself a little bit more or having an easier time learning to understand yourself. Or maybe that's where I'm at in life right now. But I feel like something yeah. happened around these last like four years and then also yeah. exacerbated by like COVID obviously, oh, but gosh, like yeah. that's yeah. that makes it weird. But like, yeah. um, <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, I've, I've learned a lot about myself, um, and, uh, have 
accepted a lot about myself and also in turn have learned to accept a lot about other people and yeah, have more empathy yeah. and understanding for mm-hmm. how different everyone is, but also how similar we are and how beautiful that is. Like not to get like super woo woo, but, no, you're um, <laughs> but it, I, there was a time in my life where I um, thought there was like more right and wrong ways to do things or like I yeah. disagreed with more people on things, but now I understand the value of everyone's um, particular place and, and everyone has value to add to something and like something that they're good at. And I just appreciate that so much, especially in the paranormal field. Um, mm-hmm. But I will say with that said, there is something that I'm still searching for more understanding on and is probably the reason why I'll be into the paranormal for the rest of my life is I, I still have this underlying feeling like I'm running out of time and I'm so scared of this time ending. Like I'm still so unsure about the end of this yeah. chapter. The, yeah. This is like kind of morbid, but like, no, I'm, no, like, is, cause, yeah. cause like a lot of people, I, there, there is a, a good group of people in the paranormal community who seek out the unknown because, um, because they embrace death or they feel comfortable with it, or they feel like it's something that they're meant to be working within or around. But then there's this other group of people too, that like are trying to come to terms with mortality and trying to kind of quell their fear of death or whatever. And I'm definitely more Mm -hmm. in that, in that camp. And I, and that has not gone away. So there's still work to be done, or maybe I'll always be kind of, I mean, I don't know if anyone's, no one has it figured out. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying at this point, but, um, no, you're making but it's sense. like, yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of paranormal experiences. I've seen a lot of really crazy stuff. Uh, still feel like I don't have enough time on this plane of existence, you know, and don't want it to end. So yeah. I'd love to find more peace around that of like curiosity of, about what's next versus yeah. fear, you know? And, and, and I do think in my personal experience that, researching and investigating the paranormal and being so close to it for the last several years. And like you said, having these inexplicable experiences has definitely changed the way I think about death. My own mortality, I think I just never have paused too long on it. But when I do, it's a similar, it's a similar kind of reaction, but also in a trivial way where I'll be thinking that, gosh, I may never get to read that book. Or I wonder if I'm ever going to like play the 230 games in my Steam library. <laughs> so many little things like that, you know? And it's, and I think that also speaks of just the way my perception of death has kind of changed that I'm all, all of a sudden contemplating some very real, tangible things in relation to death mm-hmm. rather than the big of like, where am I going to go afterwards? Yeah. Um, but also in terms of loss, you know, I experienced a, a very, a, a very hard to take loss, uh, in November of this past year. But again, my involvement in the paranormal, not that it made it suck, you know, any less or, you know, broke my heart any less, but I noticed in that moment, my relationship with that sort of passage of death had changed and I was able to one accept that the person was physically off of this plane, but also at the same time, I did not discount those moments where I felt their presence. And that was tremendously, tremendously comforting. And I don't think that would have even been something that I would have been even aware of if I haven't been spending time so involved with the paranormal. And so for me, Gosh, that was such an unexpected gift to have, to find comfort in something that I just thought was fun to watch on, on TV and, and read about in books that actually has brought a genuine comfort and healing into my life is something that I would have never even considered possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I would just a hundred times. Yes. <laughs> and I, I relate to a lot of that. I have not personally experienced, I've experienced one major loss in my life uh, in 2018. Um, but I have been really lucky for death and, you know, a loss to have spared me largely for yeah. my life so far. Um, which also may have something to do with, um, 
like I, I may come, I may have that kind of, uh, revelation that you just, uh, explained one day, you know, but I yeah. don't, I don't know. Like it, it's in whatever it's interesting. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and I also really relate to like feeling like you worrying that you might not get to do everything, but they're like small trivial things. Like I, I'm like, what if I, I want to see and experience and do all the things before I run out of time. <laughs> and it's weird. Yeah. It's a weird thought to have, but it's, it is. I mean, it's, you know, I'm now that I'm in my forties and I feel now, <laughs> now I'm just really figuring myself out. And that's an incredible feeling. And there's comfort in that too. But, you know, I'm closer to being, you know, the guy with the cane than I am being the, um, you know, the kid playing in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. And that's something I, I have a hard time comprehending too, because that doesn't feel that far away. Those, mm -hmm. those days don't feel that far away. Yet the thought of going out of this world seems so distant to me. Mm -hmm. Time. Yeah. I told you. Didn't I time. say we would be talking about time? <laughs> I told you this was, was going to happen. Have you ever heard the story of the Lady of the Lake? scared the hell out of me seeing a hand stick it up out of the water. But let's talk about the movie. So what's going on with the film? You're doing screenings. Let, let us know. What, what can we expect in the, in, in the next following months? And maybe start off by talking a little bit about the film for any new listeners that uh, haven't heard uh, the show that we did uh, more than a year ago. Yeah, Break yeah, it down. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so starting in fall of 2020 until I think the beginning of 2022, I was filming a paranormal true crime documentary um, called Death is With Me based out of the Olympic Peninsula about a true crime story um, out of Lake Crescent, uh, the Lady of the Lake specifically. A lot of people might know that story, um, but we dive really deep into uh, the history of the um, the true crime story, as well as the paranormal thread to it and get into some really, really deep, um, interesting conversations and investigations. If any, if, if you can tell from the conversation we've already had, uh, it's not a regular true crime paranormal documentary. Um, it gets a lot weirder than that, but, um, we finished up filming and finally this year we got to premiere it in Spokane, my hometown, just for um, a small group of people. I think 75 people came. Uh, and then the following weekend, we premiered in Seattle at the Egyptian Theater. Um, and I think the total number of tickets reserved was 489. I don't know if that many people showed up. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that, um, but we had a really good crowd and uh, officially premiered it there. Um, but uh in really good feedback, by the way, um, yeah. <laughs> people are really excited about it. Um, as a, yeah. as I know of right now, um, the director is working with distribution um, people to figure out mm. where it'll stream. Yeah. Um, so I think they're trying to, in their words, they're trying to find the best place for it to land so that the most eyes get to see it. Because yeah, because money is not really. Um, top of mind for any of my, the crew and myself they're all nice. super into the topic and really yeah. want this documentary to get out there's a lot of really important messages in it um but uh yeah i know that they're trying really hard to get a good distribution plan so that's why there's some waiting happening yeah of course of course yeah. that's i think that's a, a smart strategy too yeah I'm, i i'm sure there's plenty of folks that rush to get get their uh 
films distributed it and maybe take the path of least resistance, which often doesn't always doesn't always pay off. Yeah, but it should be streaming this year is the plan. Yeah, I just okay. can't say when yet. And uh, for you, a screener link whenever I get access to it. Yes, and then I will have you back on and it'll be the whole show will be dedicated to talking about the film. Yeah. yeah. So going into the film, where did the how did the concept come to you for this film? Was this something that you cooked up? No. Or was this something <laughs> that someone came to you? Or you, how did that, how did it all come to be? Yeah. Um, I will not take credit for conceptualizing <laughs> it. Um, the director did. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, just to see like behind the, the curtain of all of it. Um, but in 2020, the director found me on social media uh, on Instagram and <laughs> reached out to me because I was in his area and he had been thinking about making this film because he had had a meaningful experience out at Lake Crescent that kind of led him in a direction where he felt compelled to make this movie. Um, so he reached out to me uh, and we vibed on some topics of like high strangeness and things. And I really wanted to yeah. do a project based out of my area, the Pacific yeah. Northwest. Um, and so that's kind of how it came to be. He wrote it, he directed it. Um, he produced it, like everything. But then there was also a crew of about, I think eight people total. Okay. Um, so kind of a bigger crew. Um, but the director also owns a, a product or what is it called? Um, I clearly, <laughs> I don't know anything about film. I know. Or any I of know. That. Next to nothing. I yeah. know how to like split <laughs> clips and export and that's yeah, about it. I can make a TikTok, but I don't know what I'm talking <laughs> about right now. But um, the director yeah. uh, owns a, a company out in Seattle that does video and events and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. So his crew were friends of his. Um, so needless to say, uh, it was a very experienced crew with very good equipment, awesome. all great. of the facilities and resources that they need. However, they were all close and we were all able to make a really genuine, authentic film together that wasn't um, influenced by a network or by, you know, yeah. some other entity that would have yeah. changed it. And I'm of really course. grateful for that because I, um, it's my first foray into like documentary uh, yeah. filmmaking or anything like that at all. I wasn't even in drama as a kid. I, like never had done anything like this before. <laughs> and so I'm grateful that it ended up being something that I'm really proud of. And that feels really genuine versus kind of like coming out the gate with a shock doc or something, you know, which nothing wrong with that, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I get what yeah. you're saying though. And so now that you've got this film under your belt, do you think you'll do more uh, film work, like more long form yeah, I mean, I would love to. Um, I loved the opportunity to be able to investigate a case so specifically and like deeply that I would love to do again. And I feel like that would be under the context of some kind of film or documentary or like yeah. some kind of bigger project that I can yeah. like focus all of my intent and research and um, all of what I have to offer to give that it might all. So I would love to do that again. Uh, and if it's another film, awesome. If it's something else that I can't even think of right now, then cool too, you know, but yeah, it, as long as I have an opportunity to investigate and research this stuff, I'm happy. Awesome. And what was that? What was that like in getting so close to a specific case? What was that experience like for you? It was, I, I'll be honest, it wasn't easy. And there were a lot of really, really hard times. And also we started in October of 2020. Mm-hmm. So we're going through so many life things, you know, at the same time. Yeah. So that yeah. was, that was kind of a weird um, side aspect of it. But um, to dig into the research of one particular supposed ghost uh, was mm-hmm. really interesting. Um, and uh, also to investigate one particular ghost and to continue to reach out and to see kind of what happened when I would do that was also really interesting. I don't want to give away too much of the film, no, but, no. but it doesn't I, go. I have a strict it, spoiler policy. Just to ask <laughs> my kids. I'm like, no, sit, stop. Shut your mouth. 
Don't yeah. want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I'll say is that it didn't go in the, like, as the paranormal usually does for yes, us, it, does. Uh, it didn't go in the direction that we had thought it would. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, digging really deep into something so specific and also um, digging really deep into the historical and geological uh, research of the Pacific Northwest region, specifically uh, the Olympic Peninsula was yeah. incredible. And, yeah. um, and I feel like really I've come into a place where I feel confident that this is my specialty at this point, the Pacific Ooh. Northwest. So yeah. that, okay. that's really valuable. I love okay. it. You can be my official Pacific Northwest expert yes. in that case. <laughs> that's uh, incredible. Now my question, my next question is getting close you know, researching and, and devoting your time to one specific haunting, one potential specific spirit. Do you find yourself developing an emotional connection with this life that you're, uh, that you're researching and that you're trying to reach out to? Yeah. So, um, I, with this particular case, um, was, really interesting and ended up kind of digging really deep into myself in a way that I didn't expect. Cause I kind of mm -hmm. expected to become emotionally attached to this ghost in a way, right. like right. in going into it, I was like, I wonder if I'm going to not want to let it go. I didn't, I don't cross spirits over a period, but I like, but right. like moving on from it, I wondered if that would be difficult right. in the future. But what ended up happening was so much more internal that it almost makes me think like there was kind of like an alchemy to it. Like I almost melded with it, with the yeah. energy myself. And so it didn't really become so much of a them and me, like two separate things, but, um, but just has become me in a sense. And that, yeah. That's weird. I've never even said that out loud before. I'm like just coming into this thought right now, but, yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> Keep going. but like, <laughs> But that's not to say like in an egotistical way that like I have consumed her and like uh, I course, am her yeah. now. Uh, it's a her, by the way. I mean, any, if you watch the trailer, you know who the ghost is. But, um, but that's like uh, forgivable on the spoiler side. Yeah, yeah. You get a pass on those. <laughs> I'll only give what's in the, in the trailer, yeah. Perfect. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I was able to um, – it, it happened in a way I didn't expect. But yes, I did end up getting very close with this – story but the energy around all of it ended up becoming bigger than just one person and mm -hmm. ended up changing me in a way that i feel like it's still with me um okay. yeah so i don't know and not, I, <laughs> have i become the lady of the lake i don't know but um <laughs> watch the documentary and find yeah, out well, <laughs> well i'll watch it and then we'll talk about it again but I, yeah. I do i do get what you're saying in terms of getting close to the investigation or the subjects or the history of the investigation. There are a couple occasions just in the past couple of years from our investigations where we've learned more about the history of a specific event. And then you pick up, you're fortunate enough to pick up uh, something through uh, a recorder an EVP as happened to us. And it was a voice that was saying, we investigated the site of a, of a major plane crash out here in the seventies. And it was a voice of someone saying, like, what am I going to do? But it was just, there was such like, it was such a good EVP. You could pick up emotion. There was, you could tell there was a certain quality to the voice and man, that, that stuck with me for, for a while, knowing the story of, of this, this uh, tragic flight. And then just hearing something that really, for me, I think that was really what humanized the paranormal for me was that single moment of that voice coming through and then all these blocks fell into place and suddenly it wasn't just ghosts and spirits and energies we were out there looking for. I mean, these were act these are actual people that have walked this earth, that have had a full life of you know, success and tragedy and everything in between up into that moment where their physical self stopped being. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that stuck with me for a while in a very kind of visceral way. And even when I think back to it, I still, I still kind of feel that. So it's, I think that's something that I never 
even considered being a possibility with investigating and, and working with the paranormal. But it is certainly one of my favorite aspects of it to really feel like you have some kind of connection mm-hmm. to, to that, to that story. And, and that's, some, sometimes I even wonder too, if like, cause like I said, I don't personally move spirits on. I don't cross them over. That's not something I'm into personally. Um, or that I don't feel right about doing myself. Um, right, but, right. but, uh, it makes me wonder if maybe there's something to, um, those who like are seeking this stuff, like ourselves, investigators, yeah. whatever, the people mm-hmm. who are willing to listen and to accept what is happening. If carrying that on afterwards in ways of growth or, you know, the way that you say that kind of changed my perspective on things. I'd like to think that maybe that act of carrying it with you on is in a way kind of releasing them in some way, like, and and not just one person doing it, but like almost like maybe you can chip away at it or like um, just help reverberate like, uh, I don't know, I guess energy, like I was going to say, it's almost like trans to be able to transform that energy into something that doesn't feel so stuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, and that hopefully one day it just kind of, you know, dissipates into the yeah. cosmos or whatever yes. happens. It like the cloud the energy cloud at the end of time. Exactly. And, and, <laughs> and people who are investigating or talking yeah. or getting very close to it or touching, you know, sticking their finger in the other side, we are kind of helping disperse the energy in a way yeah. it, it feel i i don't know i'm just um waxing yeah, this, poetic about it no, apparently, this but. A, a beautiful thought and another thought i just had that kind of brings things almost full circle a little bit is you're taking a particular person that whose life ended shorter than they would have hoped for and maybe they didn't get the play through that you know 215th game in their steam library but they gave this guy phil rossi a moment of pause where his perspective changed. And so I got to think that has got to be a very positive thing that this process that we engage in has. I got it. And I, I, and I actually have just fallen in love with that thought. (laughs) I know. I was like, wait, yes. Yeah. We're on to (laughs) something. This is it. This is it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wow. All right. I'm going to take a second here and just going to let that, I'm going to be thinking about this all night now. I just want you to know that. (laughs) So the L method, this is something you've talked about on social media. I am, my interest is piqued. I want to know more about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure my listeners, if they know that my interest is piqued, I hope their interest is piqued as well. So tell us about the L method. Absolutely. Um, the L method I recently coined that term um, based off of Eleven from Stranger Things. Um, also, we all know of the shelf back there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we also all know of the popular Estes method, uh, of yeah. which I have nothing to do with the creation of that, <laughs> as as I'm sure we all know. Um, yeah. But the Estes method has honestly changed the way that people investigate. It's been a huge, um, huge. It's, it's huge. A huge innovation. Yeah, um, yeah. and. Uh, And I started, it kind of was bred from like me just being, wanting to do more with the paranormal at home and not having to wait to go investigate. And and also like kind of digging into myself too, and sort of looking at this idea of like, I want to investigate myself. I want to investigate more than just a dead person. I want to investigate, you know, anytime, anywhere. Um, And wanting to do the Estes method, but without a partner. And so I started to kind of play with the idea of entering a trance state, like a meditative state, which a lot of people, if you've ever done the Estes method, which is like sensory isolation, listening to the spirit box, um, they, it kind of sends you into a trance state. If you're really in it, if you're like really doing it, it'll send you into that meditative state. And that's often where the best stuff comes out of. Um, but I, uh, 
with the L method, I started um, entering that trance state with the blindfold on and my headphones on listening to the spirit box. But I also incorporated automatic drawing and writing Mm -hmm. as a way to get my thoughts out because I was alone. So no one was going to hear me if I said anything out loud. So I figured I'll try to write it blindfolded and I'll try to draw it or whatever. Um, And I will just kind of go on a journey essentially in my head, um, asking questions in my head, seeing what happens and, uh, and kind of investigate. Truthfully, the L method came from wanting to investigate, um, myself, uh, different emotions, uh, my trauma, things yeah. like that. Um, yeah. but it can also work with, um, traditional spirits for sure. Yeah, but, um, so the, the short of it is that the L method is the Estes method, but with automatic uh, drawing and writing included, and also you're alone. So, um, just a, just a way to be able to investigate, um, on your own. Uh, and I love incorporating the drawing and writing and, and 11 from stranger things. If you've seen stranger things, um, uh, she does, uh, I think it's in season, it's a mall season, uh, season three. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So okay. she, she mm-hmm. puts on the headphones, she puts on the blindfold and then she goes in her trance state and goes yes. and visits the, the scene I always think of is when she goes yes. and visits the boys and they're like burping and farting and stuff. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, yes. so I, and I swear to God, I was doing this method and then later on, like I wasn't calling any it, anything, and then later yeah. on I w- rewatched Stranger Things, and I was like, "You're kidding me!" I'm like, "They're on to something." What the heck? <laughs> um, <Yeah>. So, <laughs> so yeah. So then I just kind of slapped a term on it because I was like, my intention was to share it with other people and to yeah. be like, "Hey, I'm doing this really cool thing. Uh, it's really coming up with some really interesting results." Um, here's what I'm going to call it just so I can put it on my blog and like write about it and tell people about it. And, uh, and then, yeah, since then I've been able to kind of, um, develop the skills, so to speak. And it's helped me really also tune into my own mediumship abilities and kind of help me like grow, um, in that way. So that's incredible. And that's brilliant. And I like that it separates the concept of space from investigating and from your physical self from Mm -hmm. investigating and my mind is just cycling through the possibilities yeah i'm truly of the belief that we can use these techniques that we're using in traditional ghost hunting we can use it in so many different ways that i don't even think we've really tapped into yet um especially when it comes to comes with, uh, into like, um, psychic phenomena, um, and how much we can really push the limits of what we understand to be reality. Like, um, and and I also believe too, I mean, and not everyone has to agree with this, but I do believe that like energy for the most part and spirits for the most part are, can be transient. I think that they can Come, I mean that I. That's what I'd like to believe because in some of the ghosts I've experienced, they come and they go, and they, you know, yeah. they they show up and then they're not there anymore. And it's like, well, where do they go? I'd like to think that they can move. And if I'm investigating here and I want to talk to the lady of the lake in my apartment doing my L method, I'd like to think that if she is out there listening, that I could do that. You know, yeah. like that. I don't necessarily have to be at the place of their death. Although yeah. that does, of course, kind of give you a stronger string or thread to that. Right. But yeah. like the thread is shorter, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the string is the string is sh- in our in our way that we can contemplate it, right? Yeah. But again, yeah. when you try to like detach the the concept of distance and the concept of time, it's it brings you, and again, I'm going to use a distance term, but it does bring you closer to, to all of that. But it, again, it's crazy that I never would have thought that the paranormal would have me examining the very concept of what the hell is reality. And it's so tied to our, our perceptions and our senses, the easy ones. But when we start tapping into the less easy to access senses 
that's where things start to get a little a little weird. But it's <laughs> yeah, and that's when it gets strange. it starts to get a little harder to explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm exactly. like, I know I get it up here, but then when it comes to coming out of my mouth, I'm like, whoa, what am I saying? <laughs> what are we talking yeah. about? You know, <laughs> <laughs> made sense here. Here, not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> a little learning the words, yeah. <laughs> So I cannot believe it's it's almost time here. This I, I again time is the theme. I'm gonna have to figure out how to work that into the title of this episode. <laughs> yes. But it is time for the don't turn around question, which I did ask you almost two years ago. And I'm gonna ask you again. I'm gonna just lay it on you. Amanda, do you turn around? Always. Always. And I think that was your first answer too. I think so it was. And I was trying to not say it. I was like, I think I said those before. You know what actually first came to mind though, before you asked it, I thought yeah, of that yeah. uh, John Keel quote. That's if you look far enough into the whatever, uh, then you'll look at the back of your own head kind yes. of thing. Yeah, so yeah. my first thought when you asked it was, do I turn around? If I turn around, I'm going to be looking at myself. <laughs> but I love that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so good. Okay, you heard that here, folks. Amanda Paulson, she said it. Why don't you let my listeners know where they can find out about all of the incredible things that you continue to do? I can be found at Pretty F and Spooky on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, you can also learn more about Death Is With Me at deathiswithme.com. Uh, and I'm also at prettyfandspooky.com as well. All right, everybody, that is this week's show. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to go check out the incredible things that Amanda is doing. Keep your ear to the ground for when you can have the chance to experience this, uh, what's very surely going to be an amazing film. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to swing by Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Do the thing on YouTube where you like and you subscribe and all that good stuff. And again, thank you so much for being part of this journey. We'll see you next time.